Hello everybody, it's Amy here. Now, you guys know that I'm a decluttering and organizing expert. I'm not an ADHD expert, though I have a really strong interest in this subject as an ADHD myself, as the parent of two ADHDers, and as a business, we work with so many beautiful clients with ADHD themselves or who have children with ADHD. And so I wanted to explore a series on ADHD and decluttering and organizing and how our brains work and decision making and prioritizing and procrastinating all through the lens of ADHD. Now, it's going to be an awesome series, but it's not just for those of you who live with or have ADHD yourself. There's going to be tips. There's going to be insights right through this series that you'll be able to apply to your own uh, decluttering, organizing, intentional living, decision making. So make sure you don't just kind of tune out because you think, oh, great, they're doing an ADHD series. Actually, what we're doing is doing it through the lens of ADHD, but there'll be so many things that you will apply, that you will learn, that will change the way that you do things for yourself, for the people that you live with, for the people that you work with. So I just want to encourage you, this first episode is with Joe, who's a psychologist who specializes in ADHD. So we're setting a really good evidence-based foundation Um, And I look forward to hearing your feedback over the next few weeks as we hear from different people who either have ADHD or work in this field. So enjoy. I know you're going to get a lot out of it. Bye. Hello and welcome to the Art of Decluttering podcast. I'm your host, Amy Ravel, and today I am so pleased to have Joanna Bailey from Bluebird Psychology back with me. Jo, welcome. Thanks, Amy. It's really lovely to be back again. Since we did our last episode, dozens of women have reached out to me saying that that episode that we did on ADHD literally changed their lives. Mm. I've heard multiple stories of women who pulled over on the side of the road while they were listening to the episode because they were crying so hard they couldn't drive. Mm. And for the first time, they felt that they had hope and words to describe their inner world. It's like you kind of lifted the veil and put into words someone's experience for themselves. Like, have you experienced that before? Is that common that us ADHDers just go, oh, I had no idea, but that's me? Absolutely. Yeah, I see a whole range of reactions to people hearing about ADHD and starting to put um, apply that sort of labeling to themselves or people gaining a formal diagnosis from people becoming incredibly excited that maybe there's some reasoning behind some of the struggles that they've been having um, to some people being quite saddened or angry for their past self that why didn't I have access to this information? Why why did I have to suffer for, for so long without that? support um but yeah definitely like stepping into a a new sort of world that they hadn't encountered before is is definitely a very common reaction Mm, and certainly my own diagnosis um was triggered by that episode where we chatted together Mm. and I know at least one of my team have also been diagnosed since then and probably half a dozen clients. So um, on behalf of all of us, Jay, thank you. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. I'm yeah, glad to be one one little piece of, of that big picture of um, people starting to learn more and more about their brains and starting to show themselves a whole lot more kindness and, and mm. self-acceptance. So this is the first episode in our ADHD series. And so I've got a couple of questions that I kind of want to start asking each guest at the start of each episode to kind of frame where each person's coming from. So we're going to have some professionals who work with ADHDers. We're going to have some ADHDers. We're going to have some people who care for ADHDers and some people who tick all of those boxes. So tell me, do you have ADHD work with ADHDers, live with ADHDers, or all of the above? A hundred percent all of the above, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm the full package. So, yeah, I have ADHD. Um, I'm inattentive type um, ADHDer. I live with a lot of ADHDers and I, the majority of my work these days is with um, ADHDers, with adolescent and adult ADHDers. 
And you've also been part of both of my kids' ADHD journey as well. So I feel like there's just so much um, of my experience that comes from your world of ADHD. Tell me, what were the symptoms for you personally that led to your diagnosis? Yeah, so I think my story is like that of a lot of other adult women in that for a long time I'd been labelling the struggles I'd had with um, mood and concentration and cognition and memory and organisation as depression and anxiety. And particularly as a psychologist, uh, those traits of mine seem to fit really neatly into those categories. And that's the way it had been kind of framed to me growing up as well. So I become quite accustomed to those categories. And that seems to be a very familiar story for a lot of women in particular. Um, Particularly through adolescence, we tend to get that label of depressed or anxious um, and then we carry that through into adulthood and so for me when I started to think that it was likely to be something else underlying those difficulties was when it just seemed to be quite chronic and treatment resistant and just not responding to any treatments that would likely um, help with the depression and anxiety and then the more that I started to see some level of neurodivergence in my children knowing what I know about the heritability of ADHD I knew that had to come from somewhere and so I started to look at my life through that lens and that started to make a whole lot more sense to me and then went through the process of getting um, sort of formal assessment and um, getting that looked into by someone else other than me. So <laughs> I could have that um, that external external perspective from someone and, yeah, went from there. Was it difficult as a psychologist to go through that process or do you feel like the knowledge and experience that you had actually kind of um, smoothed that way for you? I think it's always a bit of a complicated thing as a psychologist reaching out for assessment and psychological help. I think it's definitely getting easier. Um, Some of the difficulties are just practicalities of um, you often know all the psychologists in your local area. So sometimes we need to reach out to somebody outside of our local area to keep the um, the relationship as as professional and as unbiased as possible. Most of the psychologists I know are pretty open with their own psychological struggles. Um, We try to practice what we preach and recognise that we have our own difficulties with mental health and Mm. with neurodivergence and with grief and trauma. And the more open we can be about that with ourselves, more accepting we can be of that, the better equipped we're going to be to care for ourselves and for our clients as well. but yeah, no, the process of assessment and everything itself, um, it's definitely not v- very neuro affirming. I think neuro <laughs> friendly, the the process of having to go and get referrals and book appointments and I all of that is steps. <laughs> incredibly difficult. Um, but the the psychologist I saw is a beautiful person and and um, was incredibly helpful. Yeah, I remember just being overwhelmed with the number of steps taken to diagnose a condition that has executive functioning challenges it's the irony the irony absolutely absolutely so let's not assume that everybody knows what adhd is can you give us the explanation that you would give to say a 12 year old yeah i'd love to so the way i'd start for a 12 year old probably pretty similar to the way i'd start for any age group is starting with the concept of diversity so that everything in nature has diversity or differences so there are many different types of trees and animals and likewise our bodies as human beings are all very different too so our bodies are all different shapes and sizes and colors and each person's body uh, can act differently or do different things to other people's bodies. And it's also true that within our bodies, our internal systems all operate differently as well. Mm. And that includes our brain, 
And our brain is one part of a system called our neurological system. And that's the system that controls all our actions and our sensory experiences. So our brains and these neurological systems, they're all unique. Mine is different from yours. Yours is different from your, ne your next door neighbours. And this is what we call neurodiversity, that there is diversity amongst our neurological systems. So having different brain types means that we all have different strengths and different skills, as well as different struggles that we all add into the big, beautiful picture of humanity. And so one particular brain type is the brain, brain type that we currently call ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And I've got a bit to say about the name itself, but <laughs> yes, um, yeah, it's a, it's a brain type that people are born with and it's linked to our executive functioning. This brain type is defined by the way that our executive functioning works. The way I try to describe executive functioning is using that word executive and thinking about what an executive of like a big business does. So if you imagine some woman in a power suit at the top of a tower and she's the executive of a business, she has to call all of the shots, keep everything organised, stay on top of everything, um, remember everything that's going on, sort everything out. And so she's the executive and um, in ADHD, our executive functioning it works very differently to how other people does. So in ADHD, it's like that executive has way too much to do, way too much noise going on around her. Um, things are moving way too quickly. And so that then leads to a lot of different difficulties in day-to-day -day life, but also some strengths that can come up from that as well. It is um, a really yeah. way of describing it. Yeah, so that's how I would kind of start with most um, most people and, and go from there to look at the specifics of how that can impact people. So what I didn't hear you say is ADHD is fidgeting. ADHD is climbing the walls. ADHD is staring out the window and dreaming of a different world in your head. Mm -hmm. So are they the presentations of an ADHD brain? How would mm -hmm. you, yeah, what does, what's the difference there? Yeah, so... You could have a large group of people with ADHD who could have some common presentations amongst all of them that means that they've all ended up with that label. But on an individual basis, they could all be incredibly different from each other. And so there's a wide range of presentations. And at the moment, we categorise it into three major groups, ADHD hyperactive impulsive type, ADHD inattentive type, and ADHD combined type, which is those prior to kind of um, smooshed together. And... Um, so the, the the presentation differs a little bit from person to person and also based on their age, on their gender, a range of different things. Um, but the inattentive sort of presentation we see is that there can be real difficulties in regulating your attention, meaning that you can either swing from not being able to pay attention to something at all to not being able to stop paying attention to something. So it tends to swing from one extreme to another. Um, hyperactive and impulsive traits, that can definitely involve a lot of he uh, fast movement, heavy movement, fidgetiness, but it can also include those that are more internally restless, um, that you can't really see it as much externally. And that's definitely a, quite a common female presentation of ADHD. And then there's all the less obvious traits um, that the person may feel internally, like difficulty understanding, having a sense of time passing, <laughs> difficulty organising yourself, difficulty managing strong sensory experiences, difficulty regulating energy levels, having lots of energy or none at all, um, feeling emotions really strongly, feeling rejection really strongly, feeling impatient, having difficulty stopping a task or starting a task, um, and all sorts of memory difficulties. It's just one uh, very brief description of a very broad range of, of presentations that can show up. And I think the first time I heard you give that 
explanation of the different presentations was that moment for me when I was like, oh, everybody doesn't experience that. Yeah. <laughs> because often when you're in your body or in your brain, you don't know that other people can't see, feel, experience, think, function the same as you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit like when we imagine do I see the colour red the same way as you see the colour red? We'll never know for sure, mm. but we live within our own brains, with our, within our own bodies, within our own environments. And so we do start to assume that maybe everyone has these same struggles um, that I'm experiencing. And it's not until somebody points out that other people may not be having to put as much effort into something that we do every day that we realize maybe there's something that is this is different about my my functioning here i had something really funny happen yesterday um that really highlighted to me the difference of my brain and i was sitting listening to a presentation and there was probably i don't know two three hundred people there mm. and the person speaking put up a slide and everybody started laughing and i had no idea why they were laughing Mm. And I was like really self-conscious and confused. And then kind of the moment passed and they'd said something like, oh, I knew I'd pitch that to the right audience. And I was like, I have no concept of what is happening here. Mm. And then one of my friends afterwards said, I was watching you. Did you think that that, like, what about that was not funny? And I said, I have no idea why everyone was laughing. Yeah. But what mm. had happened is this person had put up a slide and put a copy of their face on the face of a famous person. Okay, yeah. And I've got facial blindness. Yeah. So I looked it. at it and I was like, I don't know what's funny. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it just reminded me that so often with neurodiversity, and that's got nothing as far as I know, I don't think it's got anything to do with ADHD, but it just made me just experience that feeling that yeah. so many who are neurodiverse have, which is, Everybody else seems to be able to do this. Everybody else seems to understand this. Everybody else is on the in yeah. and I don't know why I'm not. You know, for me at the end of it when they said, oh, this is what the person did, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's why I didn't find it funny because I had no idea what it was. Yeah. And so, so many women have that kind of guilt and shame about I can't do what everybody else does. I can't keep up with everybody else. I don't adult like everybody else. Why do you think there's such a strong relationship, in my experience, particularly with women who have ADHD, with their um, the way their brain works and shame? Can you speak yeah. to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think particularly for women, we are we traditionally have been massively undiagnosed, underdiagnosed with ADHD. And that has roots going back a very, very long way to the way that we were initially um, diagnosing or categorizing ADHD, that it, the initial research was really done around a male population and traditionally sort of the under 12 years old population. And knowing what we know about how ADHD presents so differently across the age range, across genders, across individuals, we know that that presentation, the male child presentation is going to be very different to other people's and so that means that a lot of girls and a lot of adults in particular spent their childhood and have spent many years into their adulthood without this level of understanding of this is what's going on for you but they still had the same struggles as um, as they would have with the diagnosis. So the same struggles with memory and concentration and and all sorts of those difficulties that we spoke about that come up with ADHD, but without the right label. And we as human beings, we're pretty good at labeling things. We use labeling to help make sense of the world. So we still came up with labels but the labels we came up with were stupid, lazy, mm -hmm. um, weird, um, odd, all sorts of other labels that we absorbed. 
And so that then over a long period of time is going to create some deep wounds around guilt and shame and lead to a whole lot of problems with mood and depression and self-esteem issues and all sorts of problems that can come out of that over time. The other difficulty that, that I think comes up is that for the neuro majority or neurotypical people, um, they tend to have skill sets that are fairly um, uh, similar across the board. So people who um, get an average of C in math, in general, they're fairly likely to also be getting around that sort of grade in English and in science and in a bunch of things. Definitely not um, for everyone, but as a broad measure. Then when you look at ADHDers as well as autistic people and a range of other neurodivergent presentations, we tend to have much more um, uh, differentiated sort of grades and skills. So we'll be really amazing at a handful of subjects or skill sets and have real struggles in a few others. And that juxtaposition of the strength and the struggle tends to set up this message internally that I should be able to do better. I actually mm -hmm. have the capacity to do well. I know that I'm fairly bright. I know that I'm fairly capable. However, I just don't seem to be able to do it, to turn that into action. And so that must mean I'm just not trying hard enough. I'm just not, um, I'm just not good enough. And so there is that deep shame that I'm doing something wrong and then that can also be contributed to by um, family and teachers and friends and the world at large that can often send that message of if you just applied yourself more, you'd do better, um, which is an absolute recipe for, for shame. Mm. That is such an excellent way of describing it, that because we lack the wording, the framework, around our ADHD as we absorb labels. Like I can, you know, as you were speaking, I was like, yeah, I was often like doesn't try hard enough or is inconsistent um, yes. or doesn't meet my expectations because I'm like getting an A plus in this subject and yet geography I'm getting E's in and it's not because I'm not trying. Mm. I just don't get it. Mm. Or uh, you're too much. That's one that's just like, oh. Yeah. That's the next person that's <laughs> to me Absolutely. in my life. Yeah, yeah. That's really yeah. interesting. And those are the the labels that then enter this this spiral shame, really, because we're seeing our presentation as mm -hmm. wrong or faulty or not good enough. Is that am I articulating that right? Absolutely. We come up with that internalizing idea that this is something wrong with me as a person rather than the externalizing idea that maybe the system isn't set up right for me maybe um yeah maybe i am you know the fish in a tree rather than the fish in the pond sort of idea 100 yeah. percent. and then so one of the things i've been um nutting out really at both as a neurodivergent person but as a mother of people with neurodivergencies is like I'm quite open about my ADHD. I find that it's actually a strength in the work that I do. You know, I'm connecting with families that do have lots of neurodiversities. And for me to say, I, I do understand that, that's me too. And I also have that in my family. And like, I'm just, I think sometimes ADHD is, I don't have a filter, so I'd probably just tell everyone anyway. But not everybody is as comfortable as I am with sharing their diagnosis with family who they are worried may say that's ridiculous and shut them down or a workplace that they're worried may discriminate or a, you know that may not be opportunities afforded to them how can we advocate for ourselves without being forced to kind of bear all to everybody when mm. we're not ready is there a way that we can kind of unpack that mm. I think sometimes it can be helpful to speak up about our diagnosis with certain people in certain circumstances where we feel like that vulnerability that we are sharing with them is going to be treated um, safely and with respect that we trust this person to carry that carefully if we're not sure that that is going to be 
the case. I think we do want to walk cautiously just so we're able to protect ourselves well. So we might want to talk to some people that we have already been opened with first, open with first to kind of prepare ourselves a little bit um, or, yeah, wait until we feel more confident to have those conversations. Otherwise, I think we don't have to. We don't have to tell people private information about ourselves. There's no, there's no rule that we have to share that with anyone. But I think it should be a, a standard in society that we all understand that we all operate differently and that we all need different things. Um, that, you know, even though we use terms like neurotypical and the neuromajority, on an individual level, we are, nobody is normal, right? Mm. We are all very, very different and we all need different um, things. We all have different struggles and need different supports around us. So being able to just remind people around us of that fact that we are all different and the way that I might need my time structured might be different to the way that you need that structured. And if we're working towards a joint goal, like if it's a co-worker that I was talking with, then just bringing it back to that joint goal that if this is what we're wanting to achieve, then the best way for me to contribute to this or to work alongside you in this is that I'm going to need this sort of accommodation, this sort of support, this sort of environment to help me do that. Um, so I haven't had to share anything about my neurotype or a, a diagnosis, but I've brought it back to the common good, I guess, of, mm. of what we're what we're both striving for. And I guess in that situation, you also open up conversation for and how can I support you in yeah. the role that you have here? Because it's not what I, I what I don't want anyone to feel is we need to make all these accommodations for those of us that are neurodiverse, and the rest of you can just get on with being. I'm doing air quotes you know, standard, typical. Yes. Yeah. Because that's actually not the case either. Like every, like getting to know yourself and understanding yourself, there may be things that a listener is hearing and they say, actually, I don't think I do have ADHD, but that one thing that Joanna said, oh my goodness, mm. that would change the way that, mm. you know, I operate when it comes to managing my household and like I think that there's such grace in saying this is what I need. Mm. What is it that you might need? Absolutely. Yeah, we all have such dramatically different needs and struggles and I think being truly neuroaffirmative means recognising that need in all human beings and, mm. um, yeah, showing that compassion to everyone that we all operate differently and need different things. So I want to jump to talking around decluttering and organising. Mm. You shared quite a lot in the first episode that we did together about your experience of having a professional organiser come in and help you in your home. Mm. Why do people who are neurodiverse often find it much more difficult to kind of instigate action, outwork the plans that they have in their mind, actually execute them? Talk to us about that. It may even come into like some executive functioning or dopamine or, uh, mm. you know. Yeah, you absolutely. Take that where you, where you think it will help. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's a bit of a collision of a lot of different difficulties, a bit of a perfect storm of a lot of different struggles that people with ADHD um, have that, that kind of appear when we're trying to work around organising or decluttering or cleaning. One being difficulties with motivation or task initiation, so getting started on things that we tend to have difficulties with beginning a task in a timely manner mm -hmm. without procrastinating on it. And that is not our typical idea of what procrastination is around just I can't be stuffed doing mm. it, but it's actually really wanting to do something but struggling to flip that switch into initiation of action. And that comes down to differences with dopamine production in the brain. Um, so motivation and initiation, initiating tasks is one big one. Another would be difficulties with figuring out how to prioritise tasks, mm. how to order them. And so that's why you'll see many ADHDers just kind of doing laps of the house, not really knowing where to start because you just 
you don't know what is most important. You don't yeah. know what to start with. And so you might be trying to scrub the ceiling when you've got people coming over when there's, you know, loads of washing oh everywhere. Gosh, yes, yeah. all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's just really tri tricky to know what, what's important and where do I start? And then there's that difficulty actually starting. There's also real difficulties with recognising progress and seeing that you've actually accomplished something. So we tend to feel like we're drowning in just nothing's changing, I haven't achieved anything. And that's incredibly disheartening and very depressing to be standing in your home feeling like you're trying to make progress, you put all this energy, all this time, all this thought into it, and it doesn't feel like anything's really changing. When things probably have changed, it's just very hard to recognise that progress. Mm, and why is that? I haven't, a, a lot of people will call me and explain that that's happened or they say, mm. I'm really embarrassed to be making this call because I'm a smart person, mm. I'm a hard worker, I know what needs to happen, I know why the spare room is full or the garage or the kitchen's overwhelming, but I just can't seem to do it myself. Mm. what how <laughs> what's going on there yeah we're trying to do it yourself mm. um i think because we can have major differences in our executive functioning skills some of those skills that are really needed to do this task at hand then in order to try and push on and do it without those skills, it's going to feel like we are having to overexert ourselves, push us beyond mm -hmm. our capacity. I'm trying to summon up a skill or, or a capacity that is not naturally there. It's like if I need to wear reading glasses, instead of putting the glasses on, I just try and squint harder. Like it's just not going to be enough to be able to do the task well and I'm going to use up a lot of additional energy that I might not have to start with. So people do often find that it is so effective having other people around to help or even to just what we call body double, just mm -hmm. to be there, whether face-to-face -face or on the phone or a video call, because what we're doing is we're drawing on somebody else's executive functioning skills. We're borrowing from them what we don't have ourselves and that that can make a major difference with getting things getting things done with the body doubling i'm actually interviewing um a lady next week so it'll be an episode that'll come out a little bit later but it was for someone who, um, first of all, listened to the podcast, mm -hmm. then had us in to um, help her in her home, then yeah. became a staff member mm -hmm. and then moved on to a, a different career and has been, since then had us come back really in a bottle, bo a bottle doubling, a body yeah. doubling capacity. Is that like drawing on someone else's executive function, is there a relationship between like that ADHD paralysis? Because I get ADHD paralysis a lot mm. and it is so frustrating. Like it's it's almost like, you know, those cartoons where they've got, to, you know, like effectively like the good and evil on e either shoulder. Yeah, yeah. Mine's not the good and evil. It's the one just saying, go and do this thing. You know how to do this. Go and do it. And the other's like, but do you really? Or should you actually be focusing on that? And what about this? And have you thought about that? How do, is that an ADHD thing? Is that just me being me? No, it's, it's definitely an ADHD thing. It could also be you being you. There's also mm -hmm. always personality traits that operate alongside ADHD as well. But it, it's definitely a very common ADHD thing to get stuck in paralysis. And there's a few contributing factors that lead to ADHD paralysis. And so what we're talking about is where we just kind of either go very blank cognitively, mm -hmm. we just can't really think about what to do next, or we kind of get stuck that we know what to do, but it's hard to turn that into action. 
sometimes it can be sensory overwhelm that our, our, our neurological system just kind of shuts down um, when we become overwhelmed. It can be difficulties with energy regulation. We tend to have uh, real peaks and troughs with our physical energy with ADHD. So if it's dropped off quickly, that can contribute as well. It can be related to our working memory difficulties that we just kind of forget what we were doing. It's difficult for us to hold information in mind for that short-term memory um, uh, functioning. So if that drops off, we can just kind of get stuck, not knowing why did I come to the kitchen sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and with, yeah, just I think general cognitive overwhelm that we tend to have a lot going on in our minds all at the same time mm. and sometimes our brain's response to that is to sort of have to shut down to reboot so that kind of also like if i put an example around that is i'll have a client who says i'm really excited about doing a declutter in my house and so mm -hmm. i'm going to start at the front door mm -hmm. and they get a pair of shoes and they take them to the bedroom mm -hmm. by the time they get to the bedroom they see a jacket that they've been meaning to mend for forever. And because they've got this like um, energized action taking, they're kind of in the flow. Yeah. They'll be like, you know what? I'm just going to do it right now. Yeah. And so they take the jacket into the laundry to get the sewing kit and then remember that the washing is in the washing machine. If they don't take it out, they're going to have to wash it again. So the jacket gets put to the side and the washing gets put in the dryer. And then you open up the window because you don't want the laundry to get too steamy and then you realise the windows need washing and so you think, you know what, I will get back to doing whatever. I'll just quickly wash these windows. Yep. And then there's like an hour or two of this moving quickly to the thing that is right in front of you rather than the most important. Yeah. And so clients feel this all the time where they're like, I spent all day decluttering and yet I didn't achieve anything mm -hmm. because they've actually flitted around yeah I think sometimes having someone come in who can you know often I say to our team when we're doing training is when you're working with an ADHD -er, there's a lot of bringing back to task mm -hmm. there's a lot of absolutely could we put that on a list to deal with later mm -hmm. why don't we finish this task first um is that kind of the body doubling is also that bringing back to task and helping to go yes there's a million things that need doing yeah. But if we can prioritise this, you're going to feel better at the end. Is that kind of the concept? Absolutely. Yeah, I think if you're body doubling with someone, if somebody's physically or virtually there, they serve to act as a very strong reminder for what the goal was for that period of time. Mm -hmm. And then they can also do more than just by just being there, by also giving verbal reminders and encouragement and those sorts of things, which we can also attempt to do on our own by doing things like note taking and um, setting alarms and reminders and using all of those sort of other external ways of keeping ourselves on track. But I think I also would question outside of having a, um, a personal organiser there because that's when you have set a goal and you want to make the most mm. of that time and work on that. But if we're talking about day-to-day -day life, the flitting or the sort of choose-your-own-adventure approach to um, being in your home, a lot of the time it might not actually be a problem mm -hmm. and this may be the way that your brain functions and in that example you gave, that person put their shoes away, they took washing to the machine, they cleaned the window, they they did a bunch of stuff, right? And that's that's hugely successful. And that um, that flexible approach to getting through your day means you can often get quite a lot of stuff done. Mm. The downside is if that person was supposed to be writing a report for work and cooking dinner for tonight and calling to check on a relative and they haven't done those things, then that could have significant consequences. So the flitting around may have led to avoidance of those tasks. Mm. We want to find ways to be able to prioritise what what really matters when, when it's necessary. So what are some tools in the prioritisation? Um, I... <laughs> find it really hard to prioritize big tasks and I see this in one of my kids in particular is when you get given a project 
and people say, well, just break it down and do 15 minutes a day. And you're like, that sounds like torture. I don't want to do 15 minutes a day. I want to sit down and punch the whole thing out. Yeah. So how do we prioritise in those situations where it's like there's all these things to do and and I guess prioritise as well when there's like a big task? Is it okay? And I, I joked with you when... Um, I was meaning to get you these questions of things I wanted to talk about in this episode mm -hmm. and I put it off for, I don't know, weeks because mm -hmm. I had to write an email. I'd written the questions, no problem, mm -hmm. pump them out in 15 minutes, but I had to write the email to attach the questions to and writing the email was the thing that yeah. I just couldn't seem to get around to. And in the end I sent you a thing said, I'm not going to write a pretty email with these <laughs> questions because <laughs> I recognised I yeah. was getting stuck and prioritizing a pretty email over getting mm -hmm. you the questions. Yeah, it became a barrier to getting the outcome that you wanted, which was to send me the information. Correct. And I'd actually done the hard work. Yeah. Because yeah. you didn't care what kind of email no. you got. No, I couldn't care less. Yeah. So how yeah, how can we prioritize or know what to prioritize mm. when we have um, a brain that struggles with executive dysfunction? Yeah, it's it's challenging. It's very challenging because I think what we tend to use to drive us tends to be fear, um, that whatever is screaming out the loudest is having the largest risk to us. Um, that will seem to have the biggest priority. Um, or we use comfort. So whatever is just going to feel the best to me, I will act on that in order to just sort of... Um, avoid the fear altogether I'll just pretend it's not there mm. and so either way we're not really focusing on what is necessary or what needs to be done or bringing our our wisest self to the the task of prioritizing I think prioritizing will look a little bit different depending on what area of our life we're looking at what sort of task it is we're trying to accomplish but I guess some general things would be Firstly, to use that idea of if I'm juggling multiple things, what of those juggling balls are made of glass and which ones can bounce? So starting with the things that are important first, um, and that's tricky because day-to-day -day adult life, particularly as a woman, particularly as a mum, particularly if you're managing multiple roles, means you've probably got a few glass balls in the air and that's, mm -hmm. that's tricky when everything feels important. Um, but if there are some that can bounce, some that aren't so important, putting those aside, our brain tends to then think that, oh, no, we're going to forget these things, so I better keep reminding myself of them. So being able to write those less important tasks down so we can say, no, I will revisit these if if appropriate, mm -hmm. but they're not mine for now. I don't have to hold on to these right now. My fridge door, my notes app, my something can hold on to them while I let go of them. Um, and then I think focusing on what's going to have the largest impact first so, for example, if we were looking at the context of decluttering, I'd be looking at what is going to boost your motivation and your energy and have an immediate impact first. Yep. So I've spoken to my um, ADHD support group a little bit about how when I get stuck with cleaning, often I do something that would probably look very strange to anyone observing that in a very messy house I'll often go put a vase on the dining table and then go cut some flowers and put them in the vase so the house is in chaos but there's some pretty flowers in a vase but immediately that shifts the way I see my space and reminds me that this space is here to serve me and my family I'm not here to be a servant to it and it immediately makes me feel better and makes me love my home and then that puts me in the right state of mind to go from there um, another example of that would be putting music on or opening the curtain something that's going to have an immediate effect and then when I move on to a productive task I'm going to start with something that's going to have a big impact mm. so I'm going to start with something that I come up against all the time that is always in my line of sight so typically something like the coffee table or the corner of the kitchen bench um, or the pile of shoes or bags at the front door because 
immediately I'm going to benefit from any effort that I've put in there. Um, yeah, so I think those, those are a couple of little things that mm. we can do around prioritising is thinking about what can bounce, thinking about how we can set the environment, set the scene well, and then starting with something that's going to have a pretty big impact on day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I love the um, where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck theory. Mm, yeah. And I'll say it to clients sometimes is they're like, I there's just so much. I'm like, well, I can see lots of empty cardboard boxes and yeah. they're large. So why don't we just break those all down yeah. and fully do that task? So break them down, take them out to the recycling bin and come back in and go, okay, can you see the difference that made? What's the next biggest thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a Christmas tree. Does that belong in the garage? Let's get. So we're not dealing with the most important in that situation, but yeah. we're dealing with the thing that gives us the highest dopamine hit to keep yeah. going. Yeah, that's great. Um, and another trick that I just thought of as you were speaking is when there's like boxes of doom, which ADHD mm -hmm. is often have, it's, yeah. oh, my goodness, somebody's coming over, swipe the bench into a bucket. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, I can't go through all the kids' clothes, but they all need new clothes. I'm going to put all the old clothes together in some, you know, washing baskets or something, and, and it just lives there, is rather than go, okay, I have this massive task to do and it has so many, there's stationery, there's school uniforms, there's netball uniforms, there's bits of Tupperware, there's a drink bottle, there's, you know, it's all the bits and pieces. It's simply just to make, even if you use a washing basket or a container and say, I'm just going to put in everything that belongs in the kitchen in that container. I'm not going to, part of this job is not putting it away. It's mm -hmm. not deciding what's staying or going. It's not deciding who it belongs to or if the family doesn't need it anymore. It's mm -hmm. simply saying, this is all bathroom. Mm. And what that does is it stops you running off to different places in the middle of it all. I've got the nail clippers. I'll return those to the bathroom. No, 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 don't do that because you're not going to come back to the basket and keep yeah. going through it. You're going to get distracted. And yeah. so there are some tools that when you work with ADHD-informed professional organisers, declutter coaches, we have those strategies and tools and if they're not, we don't ever want to hold tools to ourselves. Mm. We want people to know them so that you can implement them and use them because they really do make a big difference yeah Absolutely. I put things like have a shower on my to-do list each day yeah because it feels so good when I cross it off <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's just like don't forget to do that no I'm not yeah. going to forget but it feels really productive yeah to to realize what you're accomplishing I remember writing to-do lists as a nine-year-old and the first thing was always um tick tick something off the to-do list or, or write a to-do list and I could tick off that I had actually written it and I think it's, it's a good thing right to be able to notice our progress is really yeah. important particularly when our brains actually have a difference in how it recognizes progress dopamine it, uh, it gives us that sense of recognition of accomplishment and it gives us a sense of reward if we don't have a brain that functions in the same way with dopamine production we mm. need to find external things to give us that sense of reward mm. so lists are great but also just rewarding ourselves with positive environments and and other positive things around us I, one of the things i love about lists is um i get much more overwhelmed by the scope of a project mm -hmm. than having lots of projects yeah. So it's much more overwhelming to clean the house than to have to do the dishes, clean the bathrooms, wash the shower, scrub the toilets. So if I can break it, if I've got lots of little tasks and then one big overwhelming one, mm. I can cross, like I can do each of those individually. And so this is how it works in, in my work life is I may wake up in the morning and have, say, I don't know, 25 emails that I need to deal with. I can, I can see in my head that some of them are probably more important than others. I may have trouble differentiating the order in which they sit or what I should deal with first, but I will always deal with the quick and easy wins first, which mm. email here requires just a recognition. So I just have to go back and go, yep, that works, thank you. Which one requires just a change in the system? So someone saying, hey, I've booked in Monday, nine o'clock, can we make it 9.30? So I try and get like all those little tasks that don't have multiple steps in them done first yeah. and even though I may not be attacking the most important 
I can't in my head attack the most important until all the little itty bitty ones gone. Yeah. And it makes yeah. a really big difference to know how your brain works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you'll find that for every different ADHD that I speak with, I always find that different things work for different people. And so there are some ADHDers who the strategies that work for them would not work for me at all and vice mm -hmm. versa. But I think there are so many amazing ideas out there um, that people have come across and people have tried and tested. And so just in general, being open to the idea that there are many ways to come at a task mm -hmm. and whatever is functional is best. So yep. rather than trying to do it the same way as other people or do it in the most socially acceptable way, if it works for you, that's that's great. And mm. so I've got all sorts of strange ways that I go about my day and go about my life. And if I am not harming or inconveniencing other people and if I am able to do what I need to do, then whatever works, works. Um, yeah. And so that does it for a lot of ADHDs involve a lot of sort of gamifying things, um, doing things in um, interesting and exciting ways or doing things in ways that might even seem like it's making everything slower by mm -hmm. doing a lot of that wandering or switching between tasks. But if it's adding enough variety into the task that it keeps you doing it, that you're going to get the task done faster rather than trying to do it a traditional way that just doesn't work for you. Yeah, or you're going to get it done because it was exciting. Like yeah. I quite like batching things. So I will go down a rabbit hole. So on the weekend I went down a, like a design rabbit hole mm -hmm. and I needed to kind of get some templates together for some social media stuff my marketing company's doing. And I went down a rabbit hole and mm -hmm. effectively created templates that will be fine for the next you know and and content for like six months yeah whereas if you'd said to me okay every monday you have to create the social stuff for that week or you have to approve it for that week i'm like that sounds terribly boring to me yeah. and it's also an obligation that i may not feel like doing that on a monday morning but the yeah. fact that it's saturday night and it's nine o'clock and someone's watching the footy and someone's out with mates and i can sit down at my computer and go yeah, this is the rabbit hole I want to go down. I'm going to hyper-focus yeah. and I'm just going to smash it out. Like, that's awesome. You have yeah, to right. find the way that your brain works. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when people have, I've been told, you know, people say nasty things about people that are not like them. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the brain of a squirrel. You've got the brain, mm -hmm. you've got the memory of a goldfish. Mm -hmm. um, I can never, you can never make eye contact with me. So that means you're not listening. Mm -hmm. But actually, like, so here's a question. Do you have a fidget toy in your hand at the moment or something that you're playing with? Absolutely, yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> and that actually means that we're listening to each other better. Yeah, it does. Because our brains, if we just had to sit here with hands in our laps, we're yeah. going to be thinking, like, we need some kind of stimulation. So, you know, when people say, oh, you've got the memory of a goldfish, yeah. say, well, here's some strategies I'm using or, yeah, memory is really hard for me. Like. Yeah. It just is what it is, but it's not It's not okay to put people down because of their differences. Yeah, and I think as a society, we, in some areas of society, we're getting better and better at recognising that um, differences don't mean um, deficits, differences don't mean mm. um, that we are weaker or lesser or that we are broken or problematic. Mm -hmm that um, differences are natural and can also be a very good thing. And so if we can see that in some areas of human diversity, we need to start applying that into, into many, many areas of human diversity, including executive functioning differences that we are all different. Mm. I think often we expect other people to be like us. And so people without memory difficulties will expect everyone else to have a very good memory. And that's just not going to be the case mm. um, for many people with ADHD, but also many other presentations as well that have memory difficulties. And so yeah. rather than blaming the person, let's set up something that works for everyone. Yeah. And, and because you've got memory issues doesn't mean you, you will always forget things or that you're you never yeah. recall things right like there's such variance even in one person yeah um, i was talking to someone on friday and 
um, we're talking about volunteerism and I wanted to volunteer um, with this group and they were like the traditional volunteering method is great here's an ongoing area that we need help with here's mm -hmm. a food bank could you come and volunteer an hour a week could you tutor a child an hour a week could you um do the bookkeeping or could you volunteer on the parents and friends association and be the treasurer or the president or the whatever and mm -hmm. so it's this like small but ongoing commitment mm -hmm. and i was saying um to the person who runs this organization i was like just so you know when i say i'm I'd love to volunteer more. I'd love to help more. Please don't give me any kind of ongoing regular commitment because yeah. that is horrible for me. I said, I am your project girl. Yeah. I have high capacity and I can manage lots of moving parts. I can manage deadlines and budgets, but please don't make me do that over 12 months. Yeah. <laughs> please just say to me, hey, we've got this event coming up. Can you please manage it? And yeah. I'm like, I am your girl, I'll, I'll, I'll manage it, I'll do it all. And then at the end of it, I need a bit of a break and then talk to me about the next project because I'm excited by that, but I need a deadline or I feel trapped. Yeah. And the world needs both, right? It needs people mm -hmm. who can commit to things regularly on an ongoing basis and people that can meet the, the higher needs of sort of one-off tasks mm. that can throw themselves into that and have the the energy and the capacity and the motivation for that um, and for the wrong people to sign up for the wrong tasks it causes it causes problems yeah it's just better to be able to advocate for yourself and go here's how I can here's how I work yeah let's see if that fits so one question that I have seen asked a lot across the media and um comment on this so far as you're comfortable mm. it seems like so many women who are entrepreneurs mm. have been diagnosed with adhd in the last few years myself included yourself included mm. what do you think's going on with the the entrepreneurial brain and adhd is there a link is it just that that's what we see mm. yeah it's it's super interesting to watch um, the way ADHD has sort of stepped into the limelight over the last couple of years. And there's really positive things about that, really difficult things about that. And it's, it's the way it's happened throughout history that different diagnoses have kind of had their time in the spotlight. Mm. And it always brings amazing research to the foreground and social awareness and people, um, you know, discovering their own diagnosis or limitations but there can also be a whole lot of stereotyping and um, judgment and blame and all sorts of problems that can come up as well I think over the last couple of years we have seen a lot of prominent people coming forward with ADHD diagnosis and definitely entrepreneurs or um, small business owners and um, they are they are a big part of it you'll also see many uh, people in entertainment mm -hmm. coming forward as well I think part of that is because ADHD is tend to be attracted to those sorts of roles the independence that it affords us, the variety of work, um, the ability to create a lifestyle and a work life that works for your brain type mm. tends to be quite um, healthy and attractive for many ADHDers. So that would be part of that picture I am um, hypothesizing. I think particularly for adults in general, but particularly for women, we are also still in the chapter of catching up on diagnoses for a huge number of women that missed diagnosis in childhood and adolescence. And so it will seem like very large numbers of people are being diagnosed right now, but it's because we are doing the, the current diagnosis, but we're also catching up on people that really should have been diagnosed over decades prior to this. Yeah, so that makes very sense. large numbers of diagnosis happening. Yeah, can I inter sorry to interrupt. Um, I actually thought about that the other day is that so many people that I speak to are getting diagnosed within the same like 12 months as their children. Yeah. And then as they're diagnosed, their parents are yep. also seeing it in themselves. And so there's almost like this 
three generations yeah. all being diagnosed at the same time. Yeah. So what you're saying theoretically is once the kind of catch up is done, hopefully we're starting to see it earlier and diagnose time more timely yeah. so that there isn't that gap of something I, I know there's something different in my brain I just don't know what it is is that kind of the the theory yeah, I think yeah, okay. we are going to see a wave and I think we're sort of around the peak of the wave at the moment of mm -hmm. diagnoses and then it will start to steady out a little bit and that will probably repeat itself in the future anytime that diagnostic criteria are re-evaluated mm -hmm. or ADHD steps into the limelight again there will probably be another wave. And there's always a very small percentage of those waves that are misdiagnoses, but the vast majority of that is very accurate diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of that, that catch up happening there. And you will see um, individuals within families, sort of the catalyst person getting diagnosed and then the people around them getting diagnosed. And that can also happen in friendship circles as well because often yep. <laughs> neurodivergence attract neurodivergence. And so there will be um, more and more people stepping forward within friendship groups to gain diagnosis as well. And that's happened in the past when we look at other diagnoses that have stepped into the limelight. We've seen a burst of diagnosis. We've kind of caught up on it a bit. And then it's it's um, dropped back to what its um, standard level is likely to be over time. Mm, that's amazing. Um, tell me, what's your favourite thing about having ADHD personally? Oh, that's a good question. I think at the moment I'd have to say the community that it's brought me into. Um yeah, I think it's something that's opened up the ability to meet so many people, particularly so many women who have experienced a lot of the same struggles and hardships as myself and mm -hmm. also have some of the really unique presentations that come out of living with ADHD as well as living with the secondary difficulties that can come out of ADHD, like the anxiety, the depression, the um, the self-esteem issues that can stem from those ADHD traits. So being able to see yourself in other people and vice versa and being able to see those changes in other people, in other women where they kind of start to, see, you see this lift off their shoulders, you see this burden lifting that they begin to see their own self-worth again, their own value um, that they're no longer, longer holding on so tightly to really harmful labels of themselves. And I just think, yeah, the ADHD community that I know is colourful and bright and vivacious and um, less constrained in a lot of ways by society's structures and and systems that we tend to allow ourselves to march to the beat of our own drum a little bit more and create ways of living life that work for us. And, um, yeah, I find that really beautiful. Oh, that is so beautiful. It is, um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Like I, I know that that's just my experience, that I wouldn't change my ADHD brain mm. for anything. Like I, I am, yes, it has caused trouble. Yes, it has shaped me. But, oh, my goodness, like, it also gives me such freedom. And mm -hmm. I I love what you just shared and I hope that there are listeners listening and going, oh, like, that's hope. That's what I'm hearing is there's mm -hmm. freedom and hope without it being like this is a deficit. It's not a deficit. It's just a difference. And difference is awesome. Like, yeah. difference is great. You can have two ADHDs living together who present completely differently. We've yeah. got three in our house and we just laugh that there's like a, um, what are they, not centric circles, like a Venn diagram yeah. of the three of us. And there's some bits where like, oh, my goodness, we are so the same. And the other person's like, I have nothing of that. That doesn't even make sense to me. But they share an overlap with someone else. Like it's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, the brains are amazing, incredible organs. Our neurological systems are incredible systems. Um, yeah, it's always incredible to see how 
how it shows up differently in different people and the, the beautiful strengths that can show up with that as well. So the last question um, is really, if someone's listening to this episode and they're resonating and they're thinking, oh, I think I, think I want to explore this, I want to know more about my own brain, what are some of the steps? So there's there's not one right step is I'm learning from you more and more that there's options and there's choice. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the ways that people could choose to look into it more? Yeah, I guess there's always choice whether you want to do anything. Um, it is not mandatory to go and seek diagnosis. Um, diagnosis can be beneficial if you're really wanting that clarity. Um, and also if there's a sense of complexity because ADHD can present fairly similarly to some other um, diagnoses, other presentations. And so to be able to tease that apart a bit uh, can be good to see a professional. So that would be a psychologist or a psychiatrist or some other mental health professionals. The way to do that would be to go to your GP first and um, get a referral to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. You can also see a psychologist without a referral as well. I think you just want to make sure it's somebody who works within the world of ADHD, that it's part of their area of practice. No one professional can ever um, work in every area of mental health. There's plenty of areas of mental health where I refer people out for. Mm. So, yeah, seeing somebody who has a good understanding about it and seeking out diagnosis. But you can also look at other uh, resources that are out there. There's really good books and websites and podcasts and um, uh, support groups and all sorts of things that exist to look at um, how your own presentation impacts on you and what sort of supports might best fit you. Um, and so there's a range of professionals um, that could individually support you, a range of groups, and then some of those sorts of general resources as well. That's brilliant. I think um, one of the benefits is, is whether or not you have an official diagnosis or not is sometimes the people living with you can or working with you or you know interacting with you can start to understand you better when like I'll often send memes to Cal or a podcast episode mm. that's like this is not just me even as simple as um I'm pretty sure it was Mia Friedman from um, Mama Mia was talking about how it was her and it might have been Sally Hepworth maybe joking about how when they lie in bed their partners get annoyed that they like rub their feet together and make noise yeah and so I sent that clip to Cal because for 21 years it's been driving him crazy that when I get in bed at night I don't notice I'm doing it yeah but like I'm making noises with my feet and and it's actually um taken the temperature out of that particular presentation that I do because he's like she's not being annoying mm -hmm. it, it may annoy him but she's not being annoying and yeah. I'm more conscious of it. And yeah. so sometimes just, you know, even if you follow good, you know, don't follow everyone on TikTok or Instagram that's proclaims to be an ADHD specialist because you're gonna you're gonna enter a whole new rabbit hole that you may, yeah. <laughs> you, may you may drown in. Yeah. But sometimes that's just knowing more. Knowing more can can help yourself and those around you, which I hope listeners is exactly what you have gained from today. Mm. Joe, is there anything else that I've kind of haven't um, touched on that you think we'd be remiss to ignore? Um, I think, yeah, just checking where you do get your information from, as you just mentioned, is good. There is so much information out there and it's growing every day but mm. check that it does have some evidence base to it that it has people's lived experience behind it um, is always really important we have some resources on our website um, at bluebirdpsychology.com.au um, and I've got my Brightbird support group that we run regularly as well for any women that are interested in, in joining that. Um, and we've got some downloadable resources that have some lists of some of the um, external resources that we've found that have been helpful for a lot of ADHDers, if that's helpful for anyone. But, um, yeah, I'm always happy to help out and to answer any questions that people might have. 
That's brilliant. I'll put all of those links um, in our show notes because us ADHDers will forget where yes. to go otherwise. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad that we've done this as kind of as our kickoff episode and then uh, we're going to have a whole lot of different experiences and professionals and ADHD coaches and OTs and, you know, lots of different expressions. And But I feel like we've laid a really good foundation and I think it was important for me to have someone in this first episode that I trusted who was coming at it from a clinical as well as ex experiential background mm -hmm. um so thank you thank you for all of the time you have put in developing your skills around this because it's bringing freedom it's brought freedom to me and my family and so so many of the women around me so thank you joe You're absolutely welcome i'm always more than happy to help out awesome well listeners keep your eyes make sure you subscribe and keep your eyes on your notifications um because this series is going to go for a few weeks and i really do think it's going to give you tools and resources and it is around decluttering and organizing but it's not always just about the kitchen sometimes it is around how do i use the skills and the way that my brain works how do i help and support others who are around me um so i'm excited so thank you for being with us listeners i will see you again next week um, until then enjoy the freedom I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land this podcast is recorded on. I would also like to pay respects to their elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed today's episode, I would love you to rate and review the show on your podcast app. That will help others to find the Art of Decluttering podcast as well. If you'd like any more information, you can visit theartofdecluttering.com.au and I would love to see you in my Facebook group. Just search The Art of Decluttering community on Facebook and join today. I hope that you have an incredible rest of your day and enjoy the freedom.